Welcome to the complete guide to JSON Web Tokens, also pronounced JOTS. There are a few key sections to this guide. First, we will look at the problem that is solved by JOTS. Then we will look at some example tokens to understand their structure. And finally, implement JOTS support in a Node.js backend as well as a JavaScript frontend application for user authentication and authorization. If you are new here, subscribe for more content like this. And with that said, let's go. First, let's look at how the sessions for authenticating and authorizing users is traditionally implemented. The user logs in with the username and password, and if these are valid, the user is now authenticated, and the server stores some details about the user, like the user ID, in some on-server memory or database, and returns a session ID to the user to allow them to reuse their credentials without having to authenticate again. If the user wants to access some resource on the server, they provide the session ID, which the server can then use to check the user authorization and provide results specific to the user. Now there is one big problem with this approach. It requires server memory. It might not seem a big problem at first, but in modern distributed server environments like AWS Lambda, Azure Functions, or Google Cloud Functions, this becomes a bottleneck. The different servers that the user might be directed to over the course of their session need to share the information about the claims against a session ID. To do that, you normally would offload the session storage to an external database and that database will become a performance bottleneck for your application. You might realize that if we could store the session information with the user so that they provide it back to us for any requests, that would remove the need for this shared memory. But the problem is that the user can then tamper with this session data, for example, allowing them to change the user ID so that they can pretend to be someone else. And that is the problem that is solved by JWTs. Jots are just a tamper-proof way of sharing data with the client. The way it works is simply by hashing the data with a private key to get a signature for the data. This data plus signature combination is called a Jot or JSON Web Token. If the user tries to tamper with the data, the signature will no longer match and the server can easily detect and invalidate the request. The only way to tamper with the data is to sign the tampered data and as long as the private key is kept secure on the server, the client will not be able to generate the signature. So that's the key reason why JOTs are so popular. They allow you to remove the need for shared session storage in your distributed server and serverless architectures. Now let's look at an example data payload and how it's converted into a JOT. Here we have the handy online JOT debugger. There are three key portions to JOTs. First up is the header. You normally don't need to interact with the header when working with common JOT libraries, but it is shown over here. Now there are various algorithms you can use for signing the data, but most commonly you will just use HS256 as it offers a reasonable balance of performance and safety and the type field will be JOT by convention to help future humans. Next up, we have the payload. This contains the data that you want to share with the client. Now there are a set of standard field names for common payload sections, and you can see some of them here. For example, sub for subject, most commonly the ID of the user, IAT, which stands for issued at, and is used to store the numeric date for when the token was issued. But you are free to put any data you want in here, for example, we can store the username in the data payload. Now the final section of the JOT is the signature. This is generated on the server by signing the header and the payload with a secret key. You are free to use any string as a secret key, but a good practice is to generate it with a cryptographically secure random byte generator and we can use the one built into Node to get a key to put over here. This key is used to sign the header and the payload to get the signature that becomes a part of the JOT. All three portions of the JOT are Base64 encoded for easy transfer of data as text. The three encoded portions of the JOT are separated by periods. The JOT debugger provides nice color highlighting to show the correlation between the encoded and the decoded JOT sections. We can actually take the payload section of the JOT in the encoded version and decode it in the browser to see that it matches what is shown by the JOT debugger. So our clients will be able to read the JOT payload. However, if they try to modify it and send it to the server, 
the server will generate a signature using the encoded header and payload sections and see if it matches the encoded signature section. Since the client hasn't updated the signature, of course it will not match and the server can reject the request. The only way for the client to tamper with the data would be to generate a new signature which they will not be able to do without the secret key which is only known to the server. So now you've seen how Jots removed the need for session storage by providing tamper-proof sharing of data and you've seen what the tokens look like. That brings us to the third portion of our guide where we use Jots in an application. First up, we'll create the simple Node.js backend for our application. We import Express and Express Router. We will be using dummy data for our application which consists of two users, each with their own set of action items. Next, we create the Express app. We set up Express to serve the frontend from the public folder. And now we can start working on the API. All our API will work with JSON, so we ensure that we always get a JSON body. Our first API endpoint will be for login. We ensure that the request has a username and password, and then simply look up the user from the demo users. Of course, in the real world, the passwords would be in a salted hash and not in a local demo variable. If you find a user, we return a token to the client, which contains the username that the user is now authorized to use for future requests. Of course, without Jots, we are putting blind trust in our users not to return a different username back to us. Next up, we create an API endpoint to load actions for authorized users. If there is no token in the request, we return an invalid response. Then we simply find the user by the username present in the token, and if found, we return the actions for the user. Once more, without Jots, we are trusting the user not to give us a username that they haven't received from us during the login process. Finally, we register these two endpoints under slash API. And that's it for the backend application logic. All we need to do now is to start the server on a particular port. Now let's look at our UI application. Here we have a basic Hello World React application. And even though we are using React here, the discussion around Jots will be UI framework agnostic. First up, we create variables for the two network endpoints. Then within the application component, we set up various state variables. A variable to save the token returned from the server, a variable to collect the username from the user, a variable to collect the password, and a variable to store the actions returned from the server. For good UX, we will also create variables for success and error messages, along with the utility to clear these messages. Now let's write utility functions for the two network endpoints. First up is login, which is used to authenticate the user. We simply make a call to the login endpoint, and if it succeeds, we display the username returned from the server in our success message and also save the token for future authorized requests. Next up is the utility for the actions endpoint. We simply send the token to the server as a part of the body of the request. And if it succeeds, load the returned actions into our action state variable. And with the state logic completed, we can now work on the rendering of our application. First up, we render the login form. On submit, we simply call the login method, which as we have seen, will post the username and password to the server to get the token. We have an input for the username, which keeps the username variable up to date. And then we have a password input, which keeps the password state variable up to date. Finally, we have the login button, which will trigger a submit on the form. That's it for login. As for actions, all we need is a simple button that triggers the action endpoint. And that's the end of our user interactive elements. Now we have a few pure display elements for success and error messages. And finally, a slightly more involved, but still a pure rendering section to display the image and the name of the loaded actions. And that's the end of our UI code. Let's jump into the browser and start playing around with this full stack application. First up, if you provide an invalid username or password, the server returns an error message that we then display in the UI. If a valid username and password is provided, the server returns a token containing the username. This token is stored in the UI and also displayed to the user as a part of the success message. Then when we click the load actions button in the UI, 
It sends the same token to the server, allowing the server to look up and return the actions specific to the user, which the UI then displays. If we log in with a different user and make a request to actions, you can see that a different set of actions is returned. And of course, this is driven by the username present in the token sent as a part of the actions request. Now at this point, the server is showing blind trust in the actions endpoint that the token contains a username that the user was authenticated with. What this means is that in the UI, we can just modify the token in the actions request. For example, change username to user1 and load actions for a user that we haven't authenticated as. Now let's add Jot support to our backend to prevent this issue. First up, we'll quickly undo the change in our UI. Now my recommended library for working with Jots in Node.js and the browser is the one called JSON Web Token available on NPM. So we install this library as well as its TypeScript type definitions. Once the installation is complete, we jump into our server code. First up, we import this library into the JWT namespace. As we have seen, in order to sign or verify Jots, we need a private key. Here for demo purposes, I'm just pasting one I randomly generated as I've shown before into the demo variable in code. We will use this private key both for signing and verifying Jots. The first thing we need to do is in our login authentication function, instead of sending an unsigned and unverifiable JSON object, we will use Jot.sign to create a Jot with the given payload using the private key. And now the token will be the period separated encoded jot string. So in the actions method, we can verify that the signature is still valid and then decode the token back to get to the username. So instead of reading username directly from the token, first we verify that the token is valid using jot.verify, passing in the token and the private key. If the token is valid, this function will also decode the token for us. If the signature doesn't match what is expected, then this function will throw and we can send an invalid response to the client. And now if the verifier succeeded, we can use the decoded token to read the untampered username. And that's it. We've successfully used Jots to safely store session data with the client. Now the payload section of the Jot is just base64 encoded and not encrypted, so we can still utilize its contents on the client. To do that, we start off by importing the JSON web token module in the UI. And now in our login method, when we get the token, instead of reading the username property directly off of body.token, first we need to decode the token. We can do that quite simply by using jot.decode method, which works without the need for any private key. This method does throw if the token cannot be decoded, for example, if it is a malformed string. So we simply show an error in that case. Otherwise, we use the decoded token to read the username and then display it in the success message on the UI. And that's the end of the modifications we need to make for Jots. If we open up the application, you can see that actions are not returned when an invalid token is passed in. Logging in the user generates a token, which we can see in the network panel. And the UI can also decode and use this token in the UI. And finally, when we load the actions, the token is sent to the server where it verifies it and returns results relevant to the user specified in the token. And that's all you need to know to start using Jots for whatever data and user journey you want in your application. Smash that like button and subscribe for more content like this. And I will see you in the next one.